Welcome back to another round of Space News with me. SpaceX face unexpected hurdles after a new building at Starbase structurally fails. The third private crewed mission to the International Space Station arrived successfully. Japan became the fifth country to successfully land on the moon, albeit with a catch. The Ingenuity helicopter may be in big trouble and much, much more. Let's kick things off. Starship updates are still a little bit slow on the ground while we wait for the FAA to complete its investigation into the mishap of Flight 2 and issue SpaceX a launch license for Flight 3. It's not just the FAA working towards Flight 3 though, SpaceX are still putting Ship 28 and Booster 10 through final checkouts and fittings too, with both vehicles still at the production area. Meanwhile at the launch site, expansion of the tank farm continues. Last week saw yet more horizontal storage tanks delivered to the tank farm, only one more to go now. A few days after the most recent tank's arrival, we saw overnight testing of the tank farm, captured here by NASA Spaceflight's Starbase Live. Next to the tank farm, we saw the erecting of concrete forms for a new building here. These are designed to hold poured concrete in place while it sets. Oops! <laughs> yep, something apparently went a bit wrong with this one. Lab Padre's chief captured photos of the balked building. We're not too sure what happened here, but it may have been that the concrete was poured in too fast, meaning that the concrete at the bottom of the wall didn't have enough time to dry and harden, so as more and more weight was poured in above, it ended up being displaced out and blowing out the wall of the form designed to contain it. Ahead of Flight 3, crews have been installing lots of reinforcements at Stage 0. Here they can be seen adding a new protective steel plate to the base of the launch tower, and we've been seeing GSE Tank 7 receive vertical steel beam reinforcements too, forming a sort of exoskeleton to help protect it from the power of 33 Raptor engines during an orbital launch. After this, the teams then moved on to installing a similar reinforcement exoskeleton to Tank 6. For reasons not quite clear, the ship quick disconnect arm has been encased in scaffolding. It could be for something simple like a repaint, or complex like a major overhaul. Whatever SpaceX are doing, we saw full speed umbilical retraction testing. When the rocket launches, the interface panel that keeps the Starship upper stage powered and fueled detaches, gets pulled back, and then a protective panel swings in place to shield it as the rocket skims past. After some successful cryo tests, Super Heavy Booster 12 was removed from the Macy's test site and rolled back to the production area, where it was then placed in the rocket garden. You can see crews are still working on Ship 26 as well, but we're no closer this week in terms of figuring out what SpaceX's plans are for this vehicle. Booster 13 continues to rise in the Mega Bay. Last week we saw continued stacking of its liquid methane tank, which now stands 9 rings high. Four more rings are needed before it's at full height. SpaceX's Falcon 9 was busy as ever last week. To start with, on the 15th of January, we saw the launch of Starlink Group 6-37, which took off from Cape Canaveral Space Launch Complex 40, carrying 23 Starlink V2 satellites to low Earth orbit. Falcon 9's first stage landed on the a short fall of Gravitas drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean shortly after stage separation. The more exciting Falcon 9 launch of the week though had to be last Thursday's Falcon 9 Axiom Mission 3 launch. This took off from launch pad 39A at Kennedy, carrying four astronauts to the International Space Station for a 14-day visit. The crew consists of Commander Michael Lopez Alegria, Pilot Walter Villaday, and Mission Specialists Alper Gizaragi, the first ever Turkish astronaut, and Marcus Wandt. After a cruise through space, the Crew Dragon successfully autonomously docked with the International Space Station around 36 hours after liftoff. During their two-week stay aboard the station, the Axiom Crew 3 will conduct over 30 scientific experiments focusing on human physiology and technological industrial advancements. Axiom 3 wasn't the only space station launch we saw last week. China launched a rocket to their own station as well. This was the sixth Tianzhou resupply cargo flight to the Tiangong Space Station, which was launched on a Long March 7 rocket last Wednesday from the Wenchang launch site. The spacecraft successfully docked with the Tiangong station around three hours after launch. The other orbital launch we saw last week was the first successful orbital flight of Iran's Chem 100 rocket. Sorry about the uh, potato quality footage by the way, it's, uh, it's all I could find, and I did make sure to check the second page of Google so you know I did try my best. Chem 100 is a three-stage solid-fueled rocket capable of delivering 90 kilograms to low Earth orbit. 
Its first attempt at orbital flight ended in failure back in March 2023, but this time around things went well. The rocket launched last Saturday and placed the Soraya remote sensing satellite into a 750km orbit. There was drama on the red planet last week. NASA's little helicopter that could, Ingenuity, has certainly performed well beyond expectations, but during its 70-second flight on the 18th of January, the Perseverance rover suffered a loss of communication with Ingenuity, leaving doubts about whether or not it survived. The rover was out of sightline with the helicopter as well, so teams weren't able to get visual confirmation that it was still in one piece. Oh no! Luckily, yesterday, NASA JPL posted that they've re-established contact with Ingenuity after instructing Perseverance to perform long-duration listening sessions for Ingenuity's signal, and are now reviewing the flight data to understand the cause for the communication dropout. We're not quite out of the woods yet. We still don't know what kind of shape the helicopter is in. The team will need to assess the data before we know whether or not any more flights will be possible. NASA resumed its upgraded RS-25 rocket engine testing last week. On the 17th of January, an RS-25 was tested on the Fred Hayes test stand at the Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. This was the fourth test of a total of 12 planned to certify the upgraded RS-25 engine design, which NASA hopes to use for the SLS rockets beginning with Artemis V. Back in September last year, JAXA launched an H2A202 rocket with the smart lander for investigating moon or just slim, moon lander on board. Contained within this lander were two lunar rovers as well. The first is a rover which will move around using a hopping mechanism and carries a thermometer, radiation monitor, and inclinometer, as well as a couple of cameras. The second rover is a tiny 250 gram rover and is equipped with two small cameras. It's the second rover of its kind to attempt a lunar mission after the first one was destroyed on the Hakuto R Mission 1 when the lander crashed into the lunar surface. The reason I'm bringing all of this up is because last week the slim landing took place. Was it a failure or was it a success? Yes. <laughs> the lander was supposed to tip over on landing like you can see in this animation, but unfortunately it tipped over too much, 180 degrees instead of 90 degrees, and so its solar panels aren't able to generate any electricity. The team is trying their best to make the most of the situation and do what they can with the lander's battery supply, and the two rovers were deployed okay as well. Now, even though this wasn't the success that JAXA were hoping for, this was still a huge achievement. Japan is now the fifth country to successfully land on the surface of the moon. One moon landing that happened last week that was successful was Laon Aerospace's most recent outing. I decided to continue my tutorial for beginners series for KSP2's exploration mode by walking you through how to build your first ever moon rocket and then do your first ever moon landing. I like to think I made it nice and beginner friendly, but I'd always appreciate feedback because it's been a while since I've done KSP tutorials, right? Because KSP1, I've done loads years ago, and KSP2 up until now, hasn't always been the best game for beginners to approach, but now I feel like it's at that point where it is. So enjoy that if you haven't seen it already. There should be a link on screen that will take you there to it. But other than that, thank you so much for watching today's episode of Space This Week. Uh, names of patrons on the left, as always. Big thanks to them for helping make all of this content possible. And that's it. I'll see you in the next one, which I'm hoping will be um, a Saturday KSP video. So look forward to that. Great ending. <laughs>